Hello, my name is Tiana Webb Evans, and I'm the founder and creative director of Yard Concept. On behalf of White Wall, I would like to welcome you to the fifth annual Lexus Art Series, Art Innovation Talks by White Wall with Design Miami. And to our panel today, post-pandemic, what will change for young designers? We're looking at our current and future reality in relation to the ongoing pandemic and what it means for emerging talents entering the field. I would love to welcome our panelists today. We have Brooklyn-based designer Katie Stout, who subverts utilitarian forms and function to create an experience that challenges the threshold of what is comfortable. We have Jennifer Olsen, partner at Contemporary Art and Design Gallery, Friedman Benda. Misha Khan, a designer whose work has been described as a, create, a parallel for a creative wonderland. And Dina Nursati, Brooklyn-based ceramic artist who has a keen interest in how ritual objects affect our day-to-day -day experiences. Welcome everyone. So to get started today, we're talking obviously about um, 2020, which has been a momentous year for all of us in uh, some bad ways and some good ways. Um, and with that in mind, um, you know, we would love to know what your new normal looks like in respect to your creative and studio practices and gallery practices. So Dina, do you want to start? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, what I would say is I think a shift that I'm feeling and a lot of people that I talk to in the art world are feeling is that we're moving from the global focus more into like a localized focus. So I see the pandemic pushing us really to think of collaborating uh, a little more personally. So, per, you know, in my field and in my world, um, as you know, Tiana, I like to travel back home to East Africa and every year I kind of connect with communities there and think of ways to collaborate. And I had all these plans kind of rolled out for the season and, you know, COVID put a halt to that. But the, the hidden gem really is that I started to really think of who in my community is here that I can work with. So I think COVID, if you think of the positive aspects, kind of pushed a lot of artists to, to not look so far. And for me personally, my day to day, actually I'm working with less people and working with myself a lot more. So I'm able to have that like really special flow that I think you sometimes lose when you're continuously collaborating with people on a, on a day to day basis. So that's kind of the general shift that I'm finding for myself in, in my community in Brooklyn. Fantastic. Thinking about Brooklyn, uh, Katie, you know, I know that you have a rather large studio and you're very sort of committed to your team and working with your team. How has that changed your new normal? Well, I just got a new studio. Um, and as you said, I had been really committed to my studio assistants and they like literally all moved away. Um, so I'm starting with a new team, which is really exciting, but it's also a lot of work. Um, and sort of going off what Dina said, I think, you know, I've had a lot of collaborations um, in the pipeline, and now I'm just here um, and focused on, like, what's in front of me, which in many ways has been really nice. Um, and one of the things that did happen that I thought was super interesting um, during the pan like, the height of the pandemic in New York, I, and I didn't have anyone working for me, I'd sort of come to the studio alone and the scale of my work just like really shrunk down and I started making all of these vessels, um, just something that like I could do by myself. And I realized it was because like I had never been, I was like obsessively making vessels. Um, and I realized it was because I had never been like more aware of like my own vessel and like other people's vessels. Um, so. I think that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer, um, I know that, do you also have a studio practice or are you running, running the gallery? I was just curious on how things have changed for you. Well, um, I'm primarily a gallerist um, and one of the partners at Friedman Benda and very happy to be invited to this panel with, with artists and with you. Um, it's a bit of a different perspective from where I'm sitting, um, but, you know, obviously intertwined with um, artists and designers on a daily basis. And for me, I think um, as a gallerist, um, there's really like, there's, there's two, two primary things that I 
um, sort of preside over or, or explore or kind of engage with on a daily basis. And one is obviously the are the designers themselves, um, and the other is the public or um, uh, you know the the collectors or or the general public. And then there's actually a third side of that, which is institutional institutions, museums. Um, other collections. Um, so for me, all three of those things have my relationship with all three of in all three of those areas has really um, evolved. Um, with the artists themselves, I think that it's been amazing because I have been able to um, kind of offer feedback, have reactions, um, have a really like have a really um, seamless dialogue during this period. Where without the usual interruptions, without the usual, I'm getting into a cab or a plane or the movement that that we all, you know, sort of, we're always running around. So, you know, somebody shoots me a drawing, I'm able to respond immediately. Um, somebody um, has an idea, we're able to discuss it. That's sort of the, the beauty of of working with artists and designers is that and and kind of chasing and, and fleshing out these ideas um, during this period has been uninterrupted in a, in a new way. And even, you know, when I go and visit somebody, I, I um, in fact, Misha, who's, who's now missing, but I went to visit Misha. We went with, with um, somebody to see the studio um, not that long ago. And um, at some point I said, let's go to lunch. And he kind of looked at me like, we're going to lunch and I, yeah we're gonna let's go to lunch and then like three hours we had this amazing conversation and um got a lot accomplished in a way that is very unusual in in what you know nor in the previous um period the other thing is is the way we engage with the public i mean that really had to shift obviously we're up we're a public space um so you know, like all the other galleries out there, we've had to, um, you know, pivot, so to speak, to to online, to hybrid, to to new ways of, of engaging the public. And we did so in, in all kinds of ways, um, including starting a, a um, pretty much a, a talk show on design, which opened up the borders for us to new curators, to, you know, artists that didn't necessarily work within our our roster and it, it kind of has, has brought an opening up of, of, of boundaries both in the material itself but also obviously physical. Right absolutely and um, I'm going to come back to you on that um, for sure. Misha do you want to comment on your new normal how things change for you? Um, the first half of quarantine I went back to Minnesota and um, Oh no, no, it's okay. Now it's not playing on my phone. Also, okay. The first half of quarantine, I was back in Minnesota, uh, in Duluth, where I grew up, for about six months, and I've been exploring, doing a lot of stuff in virtual reality before that. But it was very much like a thing I would do for an hour or two late at night after work, mm -hmm. and so it was kind of cool to really dive into that and just like sink into spending endless hours in a weird computer void um, and kind of get more creative with what could come out of that and what I could build with it and how to sort of use those non-existent sculptures to become real. Um, and then I think because the shutdown just has, and you know, going into it, you thought it was gonna be a few weeks and then six months go by. Um, and obviously I was so sick of doing digital things that then getting back into the studio um, where now I've been back for a couple of months, I have kind of like a renewed enthusiasm for just like taking any material that's lying around on the floor and like slopping it together. Um, Cause I've, I feel like it was a bit torturous to, to be like removed from making things for so long. So it's been nice to kind of go on this like weird ebb and flow experience. And how has the um, relationship between the digital and the material sort of influenced each other in your new body of work? Well, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to see if there's a way to make the two worlds like 
merge with each other because I think when you do something digitally, there's all of these markers that go with it. So, you know, like you can see that it's digital and now going back into the studio and making things with your hand, you like kind of remember how making things with hands is really sloppy and like the computer is really tidy. Um, and so I feel like I've just been putting a lot of energy and like seeing how much they can, how close they can get to each other because it feels like a weird limbo territory. Right. Is that an answer? Yeah, no, it's totally an answer. I mean, your work is definitely otherworldly in itself. So it's just like, it seems like you're pushing further into this liminal space, which um, is pretty exciting. Uh, Katie, I just want to pivot to you really quickly. Um, Just given what's been going on in terms of politically and otherwise, has that impacted your uh, new body of work, the smaller works, the vessels? Um, how does that vessel relate to uh, some of the sort of feminist conversations, physical conversations you've been having? Oh, unmute. I guess like where so much of the conversation has been about people's bodies and like BLM and um, like women's rights to like control whether or not they get an abortion. Um, And I think all of that ties into it. I think that when I'm making things, I'm not, I don't like totally have like those words in my head. Um, It's more of like, this intuitive trance, I think. And so I don't really know what something means until like after it's done and like I've had space from it. Um, But yeah, I definitely think the vessels fold into like the larger conversation that, you know, our country has been engaging in in the world. Has the quiet and isolation sort of amplified that intuitive space for you? Yeah, I think so. You know, I don't know if, like, Misha, I know we've talked about this before, but it it sort of got to a point in my studio where I, like, spent a lot of time managing people and not that much time, not as much time as I wanted actually making things and, like, doing the creative work. And it was, I felt, like, so fragmented. Um which I'm now realizing is probably why I was like jabbing fragments of things into the vessels. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, yeah, it's been like really nice to have like that time because um, like Jennifer was saying, like there's so many interruptions typically, like people are getting on planes, you have to go somewhere, you have this meeting and it's really hard to focus when you're like constantly juggling stuff. So if you have like six hours that you can like just really make something, um, I don't know, it's, you got into the flow. Absolutely. And then Dina, you had mentioned um, finding community um, closer. You know, have you found unexpected sources of infor- inspiration from those relationships that are closer to you? Um, and how has that informed um, new works that are going forward? Yeah, you know, it's kind of that and it's also the reverse in some sense because um, as we've had conversations before about how ritual and community is very uh, crucial in the way that I see my work. So it's really about connecting people to how objects are used as uh, kind of a, a, a way to transcend as a community. So when you look at indigenous communities and how they use music and dance and objects that are ritualistic as a way to basically move a community through an experience, uh, which is ritualistic. And usually, you know, around this fall, winter, I'm organizing um, a lot of gatherings with my friends who are world musicians in like Indian, Persian, Arabic, South American, African traditions. And these are really spaces where we can have the art kind of be in conversation and for people to experience objects and music together. And that hasn't been happening. So we've been kind of thinking about new ways to present this, you know, these types of of artworks uh, to a community. And we've been thinking about how we could do it digitally. And so what that's opened up is the potential for collaboration with artists that 
I would want to work with in the past, but couldn't just because of geography. So, you know, we have now the opportunity to work with people who are in Africa or some of my friends who are in California that would have been a little hard to kind of coordinate everyone to come to New York for one of these shows or events. And so we're finding this incredible, both local flourishing, but also like global flourishing that's not physical, but more virtual. Fantastic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious about how that jumps into, you know, Jennifer's experience in terms of uh, the gallery um, and meeting new clients and sort of corresponding with clients or even introducing um, artists to new clients. And how has that changed for you, Jennifer? I think that the, the crucial thing here is just that we, during this time, we've all just been challenged to sort of pioneer new networks. So whatever that means. In in her case, it's more local potentially. And in, in you know, in other cases it's 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 at the moment, you know, to to expand globally. And in I think it just go, it just keeps going back to me, um, to this notion of 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 forging these new networks or networks that were there that we haven't explored already. Um, you know, in very big, big ways. And it, it um, um, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, is it, is it difficult to do things um, at, this, at this time? And I think that it, it's obviously very challenging. And, and, but I think that what's going to come out from this time is, is going to last. You know, I, I think back, for example, to like Bauhaus, right? Bauhaus was started in, 1919 right by by some great minds who then you know subsequently went off and became ambassadors all over the world at that moment it was a trying moment politically socially and, and you know it was a tragic moment in in so many ways um in europe and um but in in this area there were there were connections that were made that that carried on so um in terms of, of you know local versus global, we have we kind of have have both going on. The, the, this the, there's like no gravity right now. There's there the, the scale of relativity doesn't exist. You know, I, I I found myself. You know, it's interesting that Katie said that she um, finds herself making smaller things, and I have other artists and designers that I work with that that find themselves you know drawing cities, and I I'm I'm you know surprised because they usually make glass or they you know it's it's a very interesting boundaryless moment i think that that if we explore some of those ideas afterwards there will obviously be an adjustment um you know a reality adjustment at some point but this moment of dreaming and is is very interesting um you know, as a major part of each of your practices, you know, there is this materiality and how does, how is that affected um, by, you know, sort of restrictions, like whether it's borders or access to um, salvage material, um, has, has that affected your practices? Um, you know, Katie, do you want to sort of respond to that? Yeah, um, well, everyone became a ceramicist over COVID and so like all of the, uh, like, the clay shops are just like totally back ordered, um, which I think is super cute. Uh, <laughs> so that's one thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I was doing a, um, a residency at like Foundaria Battaglia in Milan, like a bronze and glass, um, a bronze and glass project. And I was making a bunch of huge pieces for R and company. And like, I don't, I can't, do that right now so that's been pushed back um i've also found misha i don't know if you found this to be the case but a lot of foundries are also really backed up just because they don't have like in the states are backed up um because they don't have people working like as many people working there and also i think a lot of artists have had time to like really explore things so they're just like casting a bunch of stuff Mine finally, one of them finally emailed me back today after literally I called every single day and I was like, they're screening my calls. <laughs> I was like, but I'm a good customer. Why won't they, you know, at least answer? And then finally, yeah, but definitely like, I feel like everyone's supply chain is destroyed. So it does, it's really, 
How are, you, how are you innovating around that restriction? Um, um, well, I don't, I haven't, I, I don't know. I just use other materials. Um, there's so many things that can be done or like making little models or drawing or planning things like in the interim between when like I get the material and when I get my kiln set up um, so that I can just like go. Um, another cute thing that happened was like Misha and I <laughs> were both getting paper clay and from the same source. And we like were basically compete like fighting over like the last eight boxes. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. They're like an infinite amount of materials, and I feel like we're all creative. So like, it's there. There's always a solution. Right, right. And then Dina, what about you? I know that um, hopefully all of the materials you need, you have access to. <laughs> As we have a project together. So I'm like, yes, I hope you are able to do all the things you normally do. Tell us about it. Well, I think, you know, um, as Katie was saying, like being in the ceramics field, um, I was lucky enough that everything that I needed was available, but a lot of people, you know, in this building who make ceramics needed new kilns and they were like back ordered six months to nine months. And so um, that definitely happened. But for me, somehow just the materials that I'm using at the moment and it being myself and things being pretty, you know, small scale, um, it's been fine. But also, you know, my trip to Ethiopia last year made me realize that I really didn't need much. And like, we, have such an incredible access as artists being in the US that we can really access any material that we want. Um, and, you know, I have cousins in Sudan who are artists and then you just see like the paints that they have and it's just so basic because there's there were sanctions until a few months ago on anything from the US and Europe. And so you can just see that people are able to create a lot not using very much. And so that's also been something deep. I think like being an artist here, being like, oh, wow, okay, I can't get access to that. Like that's a new reality. Like that's a practice of gratitude that I have now. It's like, wow, I really can just go online and like pick up a phone and get any material I want, but how can I get creative and use the materials that I have or change something in the studio to do that thing that I needed to do? You know, like nothing that needs to be that specialized and can get around it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Misha, what are your thoughts? I well, I feel like one thing that I happened or or sort of came out of this was that before I feel like I was working more and more to this place where uh, it felt like an important part of a project to go out and find a new material or like a raw material or a new process to to do something with, and that that felt really important to making something like count for for myself and having the sort of facility taken away to do that was was sort of liberating to be like, it's actually okay to just use the things that are lying around your studio, like whatever's here. And it was a way that I like done, made so much work before just using trash um, and really cobbling together odd household materials. Um, so like for instance, in my parents' house, I was sewing I was thinking like, oh, I, sh I could do some of these sewn things again. And I had all this leftover silk that had come back from the show in Dallas. Um, Cause they were supposed to, you know, we were gonna make new covers cause it was gonna move to another museum. And so I had like tons of silk and all of this fiberglass. And so I was just sort of experimenting like sewing these things in my parents' dining room. Um, and I think a year before I would have felt like I should talk to the best fabricator who like does, you know, like find the new material and like do all of this research and um, that there was like a proper method to, to make a good product and actually being ingenuitive with what you have is, fi is fine and people will appreciate it, uh, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Um, are there any other sort of big lessons that I'll leave this open that um, you guys have learned in terms of um, the last few months that you plan on taking sort of into the future? Like I know that you're being innovative, but is there any of that um, newness or actually, you know, sort of, you know, going back to the origins of like what you're doing, like what Misha was saying with, you know, fabrics that were at home or Dina, um, 
with, you know, using methodologies that are ancient or, you know, Katie going back to um, sort of the origins. Is, are you taking any of that into the future? What does that look like? Can I start? Yes. Please. Just because I feel like, I guess I keep thinking about how similar this moment in certain ways feels like, I think when we started school, or Dina, I guess I don't know your age, but when Katie and I started school, um, it was like right after 2008 and it felt sort of similar in some ways, like, like there was this impulse towards regression and thinking about like materials and palettes um, as like reverting back to something. And I feel like what's really nice about this moment is everyone feels so truly psychotic that the only way is the future. Like people, like I feel like for commissions that are coming in, I can propose something that makes no sense. And it's so like far out there and disjointed. And a year ago, people would have been like, what is that? Like, no, this doesn't make any sense. What is this? And now I think everyone's lost their mind in such an intense way that they're like, society is now lucid enough for the future. So that's, that's how I feel. I, I love that. I mean, I, I feel that way too. It's just like everyone is running down the street in their skivvies, like living their truth, right? I would hope so. I mean, if this is not gonna loosen you up, what will? Yeah, nothing. nothing. Right. Dina, talk to me about the future. What, what is that looking like and how is this most that, I, I really resonate with what Misha said. I think also there's just been this like veil that's been lifted, you know, whether it's like people getting their reality knocked out of them or like just getting the veil of the, the, the truth. Like, I guess just the lies being kind of taken down and there's this realness that's happening. And I think the conversations and the, the depths of conversations that are possible are really different. I think for a long time, you know, the, talking about the source of my inspiration was very hard because I wouldn't, I don't really think people would be listening. Like there would be definitely, you know, other fellow African and African American artists would really understand the themes in my work and what I'm talking about. But there's a lot of people outside of that who just, it's like you're talking to them, but they, they're not really like retaining any of the information that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. And I think after this year, people are actually listening. And so it's like not only the source of inspiration has changed, but also people's receptiveness to it has changed. So I think that there's conversations on a level communally and just in, in society that are possible that are much deeper, you know? And I think people are, are, are starting to collect the vocabulary and the understanding that will allow them to kind of be able to engage with art and these art practices on a deeper level, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I always think of this like, it's, it's, I forget where the tale is from, but it talks about the different levels of understanding. And so it's like, you know, to the common man or the peasant, the sun literally is God. And to the king, uh, the energy of the sun is God. And then the high priest understands that it's the sun is symbolism of the divine. And so I feel like art can be kind of consumed on these different levels and people sometimes really just get stuck on the literal. And so I see like these other levels being opened up. Absolutely. Well. On that note, um, I hope that this moment and this conversation will provide a platform for discovery um, and excite some of the people who are visiting um, Design Miami and engaging with White Wall Magazine. And I wanna thank you all for spending time with us and hope to see you in person soon. Thank you. As well. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Oh, we can't hear you, Katie. Thanks for joining. Thank you for joining today. Thank you for having us, Katie. Thanks for putting.